Hi everybody, OBC. Uh, uh, um, I'm really, really happy to host today uh, Mike Albertson today at Google. Um, he's going to be. Uh, we met through a, a different, a variety of different sources, uh, and we've been talking a lot lately. So I figured that it would be a good opportunity for us to have him here to talk a little bit more about the things that he works on. Um, um, Mike literally wrote the book on REST for Web APIs. It's an awesome book if you if you haven't had the chance to um, uh, take a look at that. It's certainly uh, a great read. Um, with that. Mike. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello here and out there. Um, so Sam invited me here to talk. We, as he said, we've had these various experience in a couple of different venues, a lot online. We were at the uh, WS Rest uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, I thought I would bring some material. A little of this is might be stuff you've seen or heard Rest. But some of this maybe not. A little bit about hypermedia, and then a thing that Leonard and I talk about in the book called the semantic gap. There's a there's a big challenge I think ahead of us. <coughs> Once we get past the notion of hypermedia, there's another big challenge for us. And I think uh, you're actually really amazingly well positioned for this because of Sam's work already with Schema.org and Activity Streams. That's where the that's where the semantic gap can be solved. So I think you're in a fantastic place for focusing on this. Um, just uh, a little bit. So again, my name is Mike Amundsen. I've been at this one way or another. I was in this when microcomputing and home computing were like new words. So I've been at this kind of a while. It's been a lot of fun. I've, it's amazing what I've seen in the time I've been at this. Um, one way or the other, I started publishing articles around the mid-90s. 96 was the first book I wrote, which was a VB book about databases or something. Thankfully, it's not even available anymore, so you can't see it. But I've been doing these, these book things for quite a while. I took a, a, a big chunk of time off several years ago and started up just about uh, four or five years ago again. So I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. And this thing, REST, that people talk about, I, I used to work a lot in a SOA system, an enterprise system. And I moved out and started working uh, just strictly for the web and for uh, small to medium startups. And I got on a job where we had a huge scaling problem, and we had to get an app up and running really fast. It was actually one of these NCAA basketball sites. We were the third largest at the time. And suddenly, I needed to know how the web really, really worked. And I stumbled upon Fielding's REST dissertation. It really kind of saved me. So I've been, I've been actually digging on this for, for quite a bit of time. Uh, as Sam mentioned, the, the most recent book that I'm involved in is a book called RESTful Web APIs. It's really Leonard Richardson's book, and I and I worked on it with him. It came out of an experience Leonard and I had in 2011 when he was an editor for my book called Hypermedia APIs, which is a much smaller, simpler uh, text. This is a much more expansive book, and it really builds on his book, RESTful Web Services. RESTful Web Services is the way we all write our HTTP APIs today. Uh, he, he and Sam Ruby kind of codified a lot of that. Uh, into RESTful Web Services. This is kind of like the follow-on book. This is sort of the next. He doesn't like to say sequel, but it's really sort of the next step. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the two. So here's what I wanted to talk about a little bit. I wanted to talk about Fielding's REST, but hopefully in a way that we haven't talked about it here already. I don't really know I'm going to take a shot at that. I wanted to talk about HTTP APIs, what we call CRUD, or Create, Read, Update, Delete, or sometimes it's called Resource-Oriented Architecture, or something like that. It's basically what the uh, RESTful Web Services is. Then I want to talk about hypermedia APIs. How are they different? Why are they different? Why would you maybe use that style instead of uh, using the standard CRUD pattern? And some challenges with it. And then the big one, this thing called semantic gap that Leonard and I started talking about about a year and a half ago. Even once we figure out whether or not we want to use CRUD or hypermedia, there's another big problem looming. And this is important for any machine-to-machine -machine work. It's going to be incredibly important for the Internet of Things, we think. All right, so let's do the short version of REST, maybe one we haven't heard before. So how do, you, how do you boil this dissertation down into one slide? I think this phrase is actually pretty good. This is from his uh, um, uh, abstract or introduction. It defines a framework for understanding architecture via styles and demonstrates how you can use them to guide the design of application software. That's, that's a lot in one phrase. But the point is, REST never appears in this sentence. His dissertation is not about REST. REST is the example to prove the point he's trying to make. The point he's trying to make is that we should be designing our architectural styles to solve the problems we have, not just grabbing one because it's the fad. 
As a matter of fact, he even makes a reference in the very beginning to a Monty Python sketch. It's called the Architect's Sketch. I won't say a lot about it, but you should look it up. Basically, it's a sketch about a guy that only knows how to build one thing. And even though it's totally inappropriate, that's exactly what he builds. So this is in the introduction of Fielding's work. Fielding says, we need to be conscious about picking an architectural style that actually solves a real problem. So then he goes out to talk about how to do that. OK, so the whole dissertation, the whole point, here it is. He talks about this notion of system properties. What you do when you create an architectural style is you say, what kind of properties do I want in this distributed system? So he lists the ones that he thinks are important. He talks about performance, and he talks, by the way, about perceived performance, like a user user perceived. If I can do a lot of uh, uh, like caching or, or memory uh, hogging, then it's perceived to be highly performant, even if there's no connection at all. I think he's got the phrase in there: the uh, most efficient network connection is, or the most efficient request is one that never uses the network. Right. Um, so performance, scalability, obviously. Simplicity is really important to him because you've got a massive system that's got to scale in lots of ways. Let's keep it very, very simple. He talks about modifiability. He spends a lot of time on modifiability, evolvability, configurability, adaptability. Uh, there's at least one more that I can't remember at this moment. But he talks about a whole lot of things in this modifiability space because it's really important to him to create a system that lasts for decades. And the only way it's going to last for decades is if you can modify it safely without screwing it up or even turning it off. So that's really important to him. And then visibility. He wants to make it really easy to see what's going on. Again, it's a complex system. You should be able to see exactly what, what each machine is doing. And then he talks about portability, even the idea that I can move code from place to place or move a machine from place to place. These are the values that he thinks are really important. Now, in the pattern that he, he adopts, and I think he actually gets this from Richard Taylor at UC Irvine, because several of his graduate students do the same pattern. They take this set of properties, and then, oh, I'm sorry, there's reliability in there as well. And then they also compare them to uh, a set of requirements. So properties are how I want the system to behave. Requirements are about what my customer says has to be going on. So he's aiming his dissertation at requirements for the World Wide Web, and they're pretty simple. Low entry barrier. Remember that? That was supposed to be like anybody could do this, except right now that's not true anymore, right? At the application level, at the tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of lines of script that have to be written and all the testing and everything else, we've kind of blown that. Originally, this was supposed to be a low entry barrier to get started. HTML is a really low entry barrier. I can write an entire accounting system in HTML without any script. It's not pretty because of the clients we have, but it works just fine. I don't need to be a rocket scientist. I don't even need, need to know about objects, right? Low entry barrier, extensibility. It needs to be able to extend over time and be changeable over time for the same reason we talked about before. It's one of the reasons he picks hypermedia. We'll talk about this in a minute. Distributed hypermedia. In other words, it's not one central location. This was written in the late 90s. He actually started to formulate these ideas in 98, 99. We still had index servers then. We still had Gopher and Archie and Waste and Veronica and all these other services that where there was one central point. Remember, Tim Berners-Lee is now ragging on about how we need to decentralize. He doesn't like what happened in the last 10 years. Well, when he started this, this whole idea was to not be centralized. We've kind of fallen back into that space. So when Fielding is sort of listing these requirements for the web, distributed hypermedia becomes important. I don't need a single index server. Anybody can link to anything from anywhere. It's a set of nodes, not a hierarchy, right? It's one of the things that actually made Google rich, is realizing that it's not a hierarchy. Yahoo was a hierarchy. Google was, screw that. Google is just links, right? And that's what made the big difference. So then it has to be the magical word, internet scale, the one that people make fun of now after all these years. But the notion that it's got to scale at a planetary level. It's got to scale massively. So these are the requirements. Low barrier of entry, extensibility, distributed hypermedia so people can link from anywhere to anywhere. Internet scale, those are the requirements. How do you take the properties and the requirements and induce that to actually happen when you've got people you've never met writing software and building hardware for this system? How do you induce this behavior? Well, the idea is to come up with a set of constraints. Constraints induce behavior. Constraints force us to do certain things. So what constraints does he pick in order to get the properties 
given the requirements that he has. And that's what we all focus on when we listen to rest. We just focus on the constraints. We don't think about how we got there. It's really important to him because you may have a different set of properties at Google. There are certain properties you want this Google system to behave like, right? You may have a different set of requirements. Maybe low barrier of entry is not a requirement for you. That means you can pick other constraints. That's the magic of what he's trying to write about. So what are his constraints? Are the ones that we're sort of familiar with when we talk about the REST talk. Client server, that means no peer-to-peer. -peer. Right? That's, that's one of the constraints. In order to get things like scalability and simplicity and visibility and reliability, he says client server. Stateless, the notion that every request has all of the information in it necessary to complete that request. I don't have to refer back to an index server or some memory server that has state or has all this other session information. So we can do scalability and we can do this uh, portability. You can actually move the request from one machine to another. That's why we can cluster, right? Caching, that's why he's going to get the performance out of the system because HTTP is actually really bad and performing, right? It's big and chunky and it takes a while. It's not even a guaranteed connection, all these other things. So caching is going to really, really help that a lot. And then he picks uniform interface. So the first four, the first three, appear in lots of other styles. He, he's got a whole chapter on comparing out other styles we don't have time to talk about. But when he gets to uniform interface, suddenly he's on magical ground. He's actually now said something different. This is one of the important things of this uh, dissertation. He actually claims that everybody on the internet has to use the same API. That's actually pretty crazy. Everybody has to use the same API. And what is his API? His API is basically the methods of a protocol. That's the only one anybody can use. When, for, the, for instance, when uh, WebDAV, Web Distributed Authoring and Versioning, invented another eight methods, people kind of went nuts. Like the, the little group of HTTP guys, like, well, you can't just make methods up. That's going to blow the whole thing out of the water. And it turned out, luckily, that not a lot of people did that. So it still kind of held up. But it, uh, that uniform interface, there's more that goes into that. So not only just um, a, a fixed set of API methods, that, but also this ability, this addressability, like we're going to use URIs. So everything that's important has an address. We're going to use representations. We're actually going to be able to move the, uh, change the way the item gets returned. FTP just gives you a copy of whatever it has, right? XMPP always gives it to you in XML. HTTP doesn't do that. HTTP says we're going to manipulate representations. Give me the sales figures as HTML. Give me the sales figures as CSV. Give them to me as PNG. There's no other protocol at the application level that does that. That's pretty unique. Then he's got this idea of self-descriptive, and that's really, that's really similar to the stateless idea. This message is self-contained. It has a bunch of metadata, we call it headers in HTTP, and a bunch of data. And they always travel together. They always travel in a, in a gang, right? That's sort of a big deal for him. And then the last one he picks, which is the magical one that gets everybody excited, is that the way you change state from moment to moment is through the uh, manipulation of hypermedia. So the phrase he has is hypermedia as the engine of application state. And everybody goes, Poof. It's worse because he actually says in the dissertation, I'll explain that later, and he never does. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it really, really went crazy. He never does. It isn't until a blog post in 2008 when he actually gets upset at, at Leonard Richardson and Sam Ruby's book because they kind of downplay this hypermedia thing. They even rename it. They call it connectedness to kind of keep people from freaking out. And Roy was really pissed. So he writes this get off my lawn blog post about you have to use hypermedia if you're going to use REST. And he confesses in there, like, oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't actually explain that. So there's this great blog post where he finally fesses up. He's like six or seven points. And people, some people go, oh, I get it. So this idea of changing state through hypermedia was really important to him because it had to do with this notion of being on the web which means we're going to use hypermedia, and his way of thinking about how to keep it simple and do a lot of this modifiability stuff. And then he adds layered system, which is another thing, which means that we can do information hiding. Classic, classic uh, problem in any distributed system, right? It's kind of what object-oriented was supposed to do. It's supposed to hide certain things. I don't need to worry about all the details of inheritance or anything. I just worry about my interface, right? So he thinks about information hiding at a system level. So I just talk to one machine, 
I don't know what's going on behind that machine. There could be 50 other machines behind there. I don't care. I only talk to one machine. I only have to know my neighborhood or what's next to me. If you ever do any work in cellular automata or anything like that, it's game of life. Does anybody know game of life? Right? So neighborhood is really important. Right? I need to know what my neighborhood is. And that's really all he's saying. We're not going to go beyond the neighborhood. There could be all sorts of network effects that happen when I touch one of these things, but that's not my worry. I just need to worry about my neighborhood. That's a layered system. And then he adds code on demand. Code on demand is his out. It's his uh, you know, get out of jail free card. If anybody's ever designed any code APIs, we usually have a, a function at the end that ends in EX. The extended one that takes maybe an array of objects or something is going to be some future thing just in case I didn't think things through on my library. I've always got this one EX thing at the end. And that's his. Um, if there are certain things that happen over time that, we're not, that we didn't think about in all these other steps, we'll just send code to the client and let the client do it. That was really the whole point of that. And he actually makes it an optional item too, which is also kind of freaky. How can you have an optional requirement? But he does. And originally, everybody thought it was going to be Java applets and ActiveX boxes, but it turned out to be JavaScript. JavaScript was more than enough and actually better. Uh, Flash is basically a, you know, a code and demand extension. Like, this browser doesn't know how to do this. Let me send a whole chunk of something that can be hosted there. Um, there's some talk about intents and several other things, which really kind of follows along the same line of this magical extension I didn't plan ahead for. We'll just have the client deal with it. So that's really the big picture of what REST really means. It turns out that's not really what we think about when we say REST when we're actually trying to write an API, right? It just isn't, which kind of annoys him a little bit too, but that's sort of the way it is. So here's the deal. There's one other thing that I wanted to make sure we talked about before we left REST. <laughs> and this, um, this is actually from the blog post, blog post in 2008 when he kind of confesses that he left the part out. He basically says, I was trying to graduate. And I just left the part out because I didn't have time. You know, it's a totally reasonable thing to say, I think. But this, I think this is really, really an amazing uh, uh, sentence. When I say hypertext, we say hypermedia today, but when I say hypertext, I mean the simultaneous presentation of information and controls. Information and controls. So that the information becomes the affordance. That's sort of the magical phrase. If you think, Hypermedia is the engine of application state is heavy. Information becomes the affordance is real heavy. So this notion of affordance was invented by a guy by the name of William Gibson, a psychologist in the 60s, I think, 60s or 70s, I can't remember. He wrote a book, and it was about how we perceive the world uh, and how we understand how we can interact with things. And the notion that he had was that we perceive what's called an affordance. This chair affords sitting, but it also affords throwing. Right? And I have affords hiding, and all these other things that we can sort of invent. Right? These are affordances. These are affordances all around us. I can hide behind this. I can write on this. These are all affordances. So what he's talking about is that the information you get is also the thing that tells you what you can do, that you perceive actions in the information, not in the data. Right? So, so much of what we do is we send data. We just send data from A to B, and there's no affordance. There's no explanation of anything, because you have to know ahead of time what you're going to do before you ever saw it. That's the way we write APIs today. So fielding is saying, no, make sure that the information you give to other parties has affordance inside. And this, is, this is really fielding's idea of what hypermedia is supposed to be. Hypermedia is supposed to be the affordance for things that you can do. It's as if what you're really building here is a world, a place where things can happen. And, or you're building a playroom where you're just putting a bunch of toys around and you're putting people into it and letting them do what they want. That's what the web is. I can link to anything. I can find anything. I can create relationships. I can do all sorts of things. Fielding is trying to say you can do that in a business application sense as well. You can create a place where people can link things together in ways they want. And it turns out we just don't do that when we write our APIs today. We create these sort of closed worlds where everybody sort of marches along and does exactly what we expect them to do, rather than giving them this playground that has all sorts of instructions and opportunity. And uh, you can play this back when you is, is a technical term, sometimes hard to get, but it's really quite simple. Affordances refers to the properties of an object and the person. 
It's the relationship between the object and the person and what the person can do with that object. For example, what is this? Peculiar shape, peculiar object, but it has practical affordances. For example, it affords support. It's a chair, see? Very comfortable chair. In fact, as long as it supports me and is about the right size, I could use it um, to stand on. It rolls a bit, but it affords support, affords standing. In fact, it affords lifting, and therefore throwing, I could throw it at you. The value of a well-designed object is when it has such a rich set of affordances that the people who use it can do things with it that the designer never imagined. So that's Donald Norman. Donald Norman is sort of the, the, the father of what we think of as uh, human-computer interaction. He and a colleague, Jakob Nielsen, have the Nielsen-Norman group, which do a lot of consulting about usability studies. And Donald Norman was doing this kind of work before computers were in. He was helping doing analysis of studies of uh, uh, systems for airlines, for nuclear power plants, all sorts of things. And he's got a great book. It's called The Design of Everyday Things. It's a hilarious read. You should read it. But the thing that's really interesting about this, and Donald Norman actually knew Gibson. They, they sort of talked together. That's why Norman picked up on this notion of affordances. The last line is like really, really cool. He says, the sign of a great object is that the users of that object can find new affordances that the designer never imagined. And that's the web again. <laughs> like creating things where we didn't even think that was possible. Those of us who do a lot of work in frameworks, like if you build frameworks, uh, you get, every once in a while, I think, you get that rush. You certainly fall upon people who are using your framework, and, and you say, what the hell? You doing that? I said, oh, yeah, it works great. Oh, I never thought you could do that. Right? That's that moment. And what, what Donald Norman is talking about is that general notion, that general idea of, of when you in, include affordances, you give people opportunity to be creative. And that goes right back to what Fielding was referencing. So think about the APIs that you have today. Creating APIs so that people can do things with them that you hadn't even imagined. Right? That's really what, what Fielding's talking about. And that's what his whole concept of, of, of REST is. And again, REST was just one idea about how to use his model of properties, requirements, and constraints. So if we want to get this same experience, we get this idea where people can do creative things, where we've got affordances information, we don't have to mimic him. We just have to use his process, which is properties, requirements, and constraints. And you may come up with a fantastic system, right? Uh, HTTP is not going to be around forever. We're lucky it's been around for 25 years. It's going to be around for another quarter century, maybe. So people are going to have to be creative. They have to think about this. All right. Hopefully that's a version of REST that we haven't heard before. Some of us maybe. All right, so let's talk about HTTP APIs, the stuff that we do today, the way we share information, the way we share services. So again, I wanted to kind of cut this down. So the book RESTful Web Services in 2007 I think is really a great uh, book that sort of summarizes most of this experience. Um, now, it isn't one that uh, Richardson and Ruby came up with originally. They actually just came up with all, kind of collected up all this information into a single place. Now, in 2007, um, we're kind of at a point uh, where the sort of SOA, SOAP pattern is kind of waning. It's been around for about six or seven years, and this other pattern has already started to grow and emerge. So. This book is, is kind of a, 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 a inflection point, or it sort of marks a point where HTTP APIs sort of take over. So it's a good book for that reason. So the ultimate goal is to write a book to reunite the programmable web and the human web. That's sort of the commentary, to reunite programming, which had kind of turned into this soap thing, with the human web, the web that we talked about, sort of just being as excited as I just was. And it talks about using protocols and principles and so on and so forth. And basically what it does is it focuses on this notion of a way to consider differences in APIs. So Leonard Richardson gives a talk right about the release of this book, and he actually calls it the Richardson, he actually calls it the hypermedia maturity heuristic. 
But people don't really remember that one. What they remember is a few years later, Martin Fowler finds this material and writes about it, and he calls it the Richardson Maturity Model. And he's got this graphic that shows up all the time now. And it's this graphic that talks about this sort of level of maturity. And it takes from, it's a story that Leonard had, had written. Leonard really didn't think this would be some kind of actual measure. He was just sort of telling a story. And his was actually, you start with uh, URIs, and then you add verbs, and then you add hypermedia. That was sort of his story. And it sort of morphed into something else. So we have this notion of judging the way people's APIs look that have come out of this. Uh, level zero is the basically what we think of as SOAP. I'm always in HTTP, I'm always using posts, and I'm always sending messages to the same URL all the time, sometimes referred to as tunneling. Uh, level one is this idea where I'm still using posts and sending messages, but I'm not sending it to the same URL anymore. Now every object kind of has its own URL, but I still use posts, and I still always send message values. And then we get to this thing called HTTP verbs, where I no longer just use post. I can use get, and I can use put, and I can use delete. Uh, at the time, that it was, wasn't in vogue, but you could use patch. So now I'm, I'm doing these things, and I don't always have to send a body. I can actually send arguments in a URL. This turns out to be what we do most today. is what we think of as HTTP URIs, the create, read, update, delete pattern. But uh, Leonard had also identified this notion of using hypermedia instead of actually just memorizing this pattern of create, read, update, delete. Uh, and he talked about it in his, uh, in his speech. You can find it online. There'll be notes in the slides that you can pick up. Um, but uh, it's not, it wasn't, again, it was sort of kind of glossed over. Martin Fowler didn't really understand much of it. He, he kind of gave a slight description. But sort of the, the thing that Martin came up with is this notion of this glory of rest, like we're all trying to get to some magical place. It wasn't originally Leonard's idea, but that's sort of how it's all kind of grown. So what happens is this, this little uh, top-level thing sort of becomes a target, and it also becomes a dismissive. So most people focus on this verb thing, and that's how we write our APIs today. We use verbs, get, put, post, and delete, and we uh, use URIs with those addresses, and we send some object body, some object serializations with them, and that's how we write our HTTP API. So it's sometimes referred to as, as uh, resource-oriented architecture, which comes out of Leonard and Sam's book. But often it's referred to as the CRUD pattern, or create, read, update, delete. So this is from Joe Gregorio's blog. So this is from 2006, I think. But didn't this also appear in XML.com, I think? I think this also appeared in XML.com. So, but I, I like this slide because it sort of encapsulates the understanding we have of how to write HTTP eyes for the web. We have this resource, this thing it, that usually is a URI, but you know we can just have a name. Employee could be whack employee, right? And then we have methods, and then we have some representation, some body that we either send or receive, and then we have some understanding of status codes that come back and forth. And this is really what we think of as writing HTTP APIs. It's really a way to kind of do the same function calling, function pattern, that we always know when we're doing all our own uh, local programming over the web and using HTTP to do it. He also has four great questions in it. And this is, this is sort of like the modeling pattern you go through your head. First, figure out what your URIs are. How are you going to model your URIs? Then figure out what formats you're going to send back and forth. Is it going to be an XML variant or a JSON variant or an HTML variant, stuff like that? What methods are you going to do? Sometimes you can't write. You're just doing gets. And then finally, what status codes are you going to return? And this, this actually affects a whole bunch of people. The whole Rails community picks up on this. And they write a lot of their code. Active Record and, and all, Active all these other pieces actually do just this. They sort of lead you into doing these things, picking resources, then they create a URI for you. They have some additional uh, arguments that they use to kind of make it easy for them to do stuff in the back end. But this is exactly what you end up going through. There's a little additional guidance that actually comes along with this, and that is that URI design is your real job. It sucks because now you're doing namespace management for the planet. Right? For instance, in SOAP, I never had to do that. I got one URI and everything happened underneath that. I didn't have to worry about all this other stuff. Now I have hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of URIs I'm responsible for, including securing. But this is the thing we do, right? And then we focus on serializing domain objects, like I have a user object, and a customer object, and a warehouse object, and a person object, and a Gmail object, and a connection object, and a friend object, 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 right? 
So we do that, and then we use these relationships. We use the URIs again to express relationships. So if you have a friend, it's got to be hanging off some user and so on and so forth. So now people get really excited. There's even a, a, a set of guidance that I'm only supposed to have so many slashes in my URL because it becomes unusable at that point. So we're all interested in managing these, uh, these shapes. And then finally, it turns out there's a bunch of things that don't fit the CRUD pattern. Um, Subal al Miraju in his book, uh, Restful Web Services Cookbook, calls them controllers, I think, which I think is a really good name. This idea that there's reports or something that computes taxes or several other things in there. So this becomes sort of the, this is the style, this is the guidance. So you can sort of think of this as if I want to paint like Picasso, what are my rules? Then I'm going to use these things, I'm going to do these things. Now we all sort of look generally the same. Unfortunately, we only look generally the same. The problem is every one of these APIs becomes a snowflake. Every one of these objects, everybody's got a user object and it's different. Everybody's idea of what a URI shape is is different. And it gets really hard to share. It's pretty good to get these up and running, but they become really difficult to share, to mash up, unless you sort of treat every single one as its own universe. So um, I'm not going to run the, the app, but um, there's, a, there's a pointer in the content uh, to uh, a, a Heroku site where you can kind of play around with this. Basically, this is typically, I, I made this like really, really simple, really, really low end. This is the kind of data we would get back, right? So we would get a list of tasks and their IDs and their text, and that's it. This is almost what some people refer to as the classic Flickr API. It's just got an ID and some stuff. You're on your own after this, right? So we talked about this affordance thing earlier. Like it tells you what you can do and how you can do it. Nobody's telling you nothing here. Right? You have no idea if you look at this message what you can do or even how to do it, what the URIs are supposed to be. All right, so what do we do? We go read human documentation, right? We go read uh, of the, all of the pros that explains that what you do is you take that ID and you add this base URL to it, and then you make a call with using this H protocol with this method to it, and then you're going to get possibly some other responses back. So we read all those details. And once we read those details, we bake them into code, right? So we make our code memorize what we just read, and then act that out, right? That becomes our agent. And we hope to God nobody changes the documentation because I'll never know when they just send this stuff because it's all human readable again, right? So I'm tied back to human readable. It's almost as if, and Leonard does a great talk on this, I'm pretty sure it's in the notes in this slide. A, he does a talk called Following Instructions or How to Follow Instructions. And he basically starts to describe a web where we type everything in based on text. Type the following in to your browser to go to this next thing. Type the following, you know, and there's no links. In fact, that's what it was like before Tim Berners-Lee. If you ever did BBS work, you did these, like, big BBS sites or FTP sites, they would literally explain to you, go to this one FTP server and then go down five levels with these names and then look for the file that says so-and-so and download that file. That's exactly how we did it. We didn't have a link to that file. And that's really what this sort of depends on. So what happens is I write code that really translates the human documentation. So I memorize all of the addresses I'm going to need to, and I turn at least uh, some of them into some kind of uh, uh, you know, format so that I can easily you know, make it a template. And then for every possible action, I write code. This is how I refresh. This is how I search. This is how I add. This is how I mark something complete. This is how I get the list. And I have a little bit of stuff down here, which is basically my little Ajax work and a little cleanup stuff for local. But I memorize all these steps. Now what happens if somebody adds a new step? Well, my code doesn't work. It's not gonna, right? Because I didn't memorize it. Or what if they change the rules? What if they change the URLs? I'm toast, right? Because there's no other way for me to understand that except for somebody to explain it to me again, like over the phone or in documentation, and hopefully it's in a language that I understand, right? It's not from halfway around the world in characters that I don't understand, but that'd be a bummer. Right? So that's how we build APIs today, using this pattern. So we build these bespoke clients, one-off clients, every time. But there's another way. And that's really the book that Leonard and I wrote in 2013. Let's, let's think about another way. And let's think about that thing about linking. So this is, again, this is from the, uh, I think this is from the introduction. 
Um, Restful Web Services covered hypermedia, but it wasn't central to the book. That's a little uh, nod to Roy being a little annoyed at us. It was possible to skip the parts of the book and still design an API. By contrast, RESTful Web APIs is effectively a book about hypermedia. You can't escape it. I've already had I've already had email from people saying that this sucks. I like the other book better. <laughs> so I know we must be doing something right. So it's a book about hypermedia. What does that really mean? Well, I'm going to go back to 2010 when I put together a thing called Hypermedia Factors. I was trying to figure out what is hypermedia? What is this really? Can we boil this down? I want to, I want to think about this in a, in a relatively abstract way and boil it down. So what I did is I came up with this notion of a, a, a set of things called factors or elements or aspects. I didn't know what to call and that is that in almost every hypermedia type, you have the same set of things available over and over again in, the, in our networks. And I, I call them link factors and control factors. So uh, linking outbound, which is basically a navigation. There's some explanation that says, take this address and go there. Right? That's a factor. That's a, that's a, a way of expressing something you can do. And there's also the link embeds, or the, what uh, Ted Nelson calls transclusion. Take this, this URL and bring that thing here. Usually we do that with images, but we also do it with iframes. Right? So there's a whole family of things that say, transclude that from over there into here. There's another family that says, go over there. Right? Th these are hypermedia elements. There is also this notion of a hypermedia template. It's a link. But you actually can pick a few things. I'm going to give you some variables. And you fill in those variables, and then I'll construct a link from that, and then I'll go there. Right? And that link may be filtering. It may be selecting one particular record. That's a, that's a sort of a, a mutable uh, idea of a link. Right? And then I also have this notion of non-item potent. Right? So item potent means it has the same strength every time. You think of uh, SQL, I'm doing a SQL update. I do a SQL update to change the field 3 to 5, from 4 to 5. I can do that SQL update 17 times. It's only going to be 5 every time. It has the same strength every time. So in uh, HTTP, we have that same pattern, too. We have item potent methods. Put is an item potent method. I can put the same body 17 times into, into the server, and it's always going to be the exact same. That's item potent. That's put. But there's another one called post is not item potent. We know exactly what that means, right? So I'm on Mike's blog, and I comment on his uh, thing, and I hit enter, and I don't see the comment. Crap. So I type it again, and I hit enter, and all of a sudden, two show up. Non-item potent. That's post. So we have this notion of a not-item potent thing. It looks a lot like, in HTML, it looks a lot like this uh, same link, but it creates a body, and it sends a message, and it keeps adding to. If you look in the in the documentation, it says append or a couple other phrases like that. Actually, post is a sort of wacky thing that does almost everything and all the bad things. And then there's also the item potent version. I, there's no item potent uh, activity supported in HTML. You can only do get and post. So that's why we have this massive polyfill called AJAX. Right? Because we wanted to do put and delete. But nobody on the committees of HTML or the browser gang has ever allowed that to happen. So we just use a polyfill. All right? That's what we do. So we have this idea of non-inopotent and inopotent links, things that explain guarantees. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later. There are also some control elements that aren't, don't have to do with the actual protocol method or the actual uh, navigation or transclusion. That lets us control how we're going to read something. So in HTTP, we can actually use the accept header. This is actually supported in XML includes as well. So go here, and by the way, I want RSS, right? I'm actually modifying the way that should behave for me. Um, so we also have the I, way to do this for updates as well. So we can actually have servers say, by the way, when you format your message to me, use form URL encoded, or use multi-part, or use plain text in HTML5. You can actually do plain text now, too. It's sort of a YAML kind of experience. Um, some formats let you actually decide the method yourself. So in here, method equals post. Uh, Adam doesn't let you decide the method yourself, right? Adam tells you, when you see rel edit, you've got three possibilities. You can either do a get on it, you can do a put on it, or you can do a delete on it. Thank you very much. Go home. 
It doesn't allow servers to actually put that information in the message. That's set ahead of time, right? And then you actually you can do this thing called you can mark the link, and that's exactly, by the way, what uh, Adam does. Adam says rel edit is magical. You see rel edit. This tells you a whole bunch of things now. And that you can edit this record, and you can use get, and you can use put, and you can use delete. Uh, browsers use that with rel equals style sheet. That's magical. Oh, no, no, no. What you do is you go get this thing, see? And then you apply it to everything on the page. That's, <coughs> that's a link relation that's magical. So you can change behavior if you establish these rules. So uh, my point here was that if you take these ideas of links and controls, you can explain just about every one of these affordance actions that we're used to doing. Um, you can actually create a grid. A lot of these sort of uh, cancel each other out. But there's a limited set of possibilities. Uh, there's a few that never show up. So um, I think, oh yeah. So it turns out in HTML, there is no template for transclusion. Right? So I can use a form for a navigation. That's called a get. Right? But I can't use a form to decide which picture I get brought back to me. So there are sort of, sort of a few things missing in this Swiss cheese of approach. You can sort of work through this puzzle, and you can find some other things that aren't there. That's the one that's most interesting to me, but there are a couple other ones. So it turns out you take this information together, you can sort of you can grade or match or analyze message models. So this is the, uh, the hypermedia signature for SVG. <coughs> Embeds and outbounds, that's it. SVG doesn't support post or patch or delete. Doesn't need to. Uh, Adam, notice Adam doesn't have templates. I don't have a native way to explain uh, how to do a filter or a search form in Adam. Luckily, I can use OpenSearch to do that, but it's not native to Adam. I use an extension. Adam doesn't let me set methods or control uh, uh, reads or updates. I might be able to control reads, actually, if you, there's a, there's an extension in the publishing protocol. Uh, what is that? Service document that may actually say what formats I can use. Uh, here's HTML. Again, I don't have any idempotent links. And I don't have a lot of control over reads. I can't actually say. Uh, I can use hints, but those hints don't actually translate into headers. right? So I can have a link that says there's probably RSS at the other end here, but it doesn't actually force the client to actually send an RSS header. Anyway, you can use these, and you can actually use these to start to pick out formats that solve the problems you want to solve, or to analyze new formats. So again, how do I boil this down? It's real simple. Three things. Navigations, transclusions, and forms that give you this mutability, this ability to change things, to sort of give you instructions on how you can do stuff. Suddenly now, this is the affordance that Fielding was talking about. Now I can send affordances with responses. I can send, here's your list of all of the things to do. And by the way, these three, you can actually edit. This one you can't. Somebody else wrote that. You can't edit that. And if it turns out you can add, I'll add the affordance for adding one, too. Maybe you're just a guest. You're not allowed to add. So I won't add the affordance now. But maybe you're an owner. You can, you can now add some. So now all of a sudden the messages contain additional information that they didn't have before. They're no longer static documents. They actually reflect state. They reflect context. Um, maybe I've got an application that does uh, let me uh, uh, do order picking out of a warehouse. But it turns out the warehouse is shut down for a uh, recount. So I'm not going to allow anybody to do orders for the next 24 hours. I just don't include the links and forms that allow that to happen. I don't have to tell anybody anything special. They just suddenly don't show up. There's a lot of things you can do. Once you look at the notion that you have the opportunity to include affordances in your playground, you can decide what tools, what toys show up. So again, there's, there's another app that, uh, that you can test out that is the same idea. It's really simplistic. But now in this case, suddenly you can see that at the top of the page, we'll, we'll take a look at it a little bit, I actually include links which explain exactly what you can do. It says, yeah, you can add. And what you do is, you use this method and you send this argument. And you can get a list and you can search because what you do is you use this method and then you use this argument. So I'm actually explaining in the message. This comes back in the message. And then when I actually even get the list of things to do, 
It says, yeah, there's there's this one thing, and by the way, there's here's something you can do. You can mark it complete. You can use this method with this argument. So now the message is the information that contains the affordance. It's not that hard. So that means I write a different app. So my app doesn't have to memorize all those things anymore. What my app says is, oh, go get the response and render it, please. Um, there are some buttons that may show up based on any hypermedia, so I had to do a little memorization. It's not like I'm, I'm totally uncoupled. Uh, but that's it. I don't have anything called refresh or search or add or anything like that. So what if I'm working with a service that doesn't let me do searches? Fine, this client will work great. Or I'm working with a client that only lets me do searches. This client will work great for me because that service will send me the search information and nothing else. What if one of the sites has search information that has two arguments and not one? This will work fine. Right? Because I'm rendering the response, I'm looking at the affordances, I'm rendering the affordances and saying, go nuts. Suddenly, I have this dynamic space. And it turns out this client can work with lots of services whom I've never met. Now, if I tell you I'm using this to-do message model, you can run your own server in any language you want. And you can use whatever features you want as long as they're within the bounds of this, of this message model. And you can advertise, by the way, I do to-do list too. And the same client can work over and over and over and over. Or that client can be just a small library in a big system, right? So now I can have a client that plugs, oh, it does to-dos, and it does accounting, and it does microblogging. It knows all these things. And I can plug new things in. And that's code on demand. That's the notion that suddenly I can change the shape of that client or the knowledge of that client because I've got some shared understanding that goes beyond step by step by step. Um, this is very, very simplistic, but I can change workflow this way too. So I don't have to, you don't have to memorize step one, two, three. I'll give you the steps. And if the steps change next month, no worries. So that leads us to the bigger problem. This is really the big challenge. So what I just described is this notion of being able to describe protocol in detail and write clients that are able to support that, those protocol actions. This is a post, this is a get, this is a patch, I front end it this way. Cool. Why? Why do a post? Why do a patch? What am I doing here? Protocol is very low level, right? We don't really write protocol apps, right? We write domain apps. We write uh, to-do apps. We write accounting apps. We write microblogging apps. We don't write protocol apps. And accounting and to-do and Google Plus and all those other things, that's an application. That's application domain. And that's the semantics that Leonard and I are talking about when we talk about the semantic gap. It's fine once we settle on this notion of being able to explain uh, hypermedia in a machine readable fashion. We're still not even there yet, but I think we're getting very close. But then there's the big one. And the big one is the semantics. So it turns out this is a problem that's been around a long time, and some very, very smart people have been working on this for close to a decade. Uh, Dublin Core is this notion of uh, all these librarians got together and they wanted to describe all these words that were meaningful to their domain that could help them. And what I thought was really was really smart in the year 2000 is they described this information without deciding on a format or a protocol. They said, let's just talk about the vocabulary that we're dealing with here. I even like the notion that most all of Dublin Core is also not hierarchical. It's literally a dictionary. It's a bunch of words and it has explanations that this whole committee agreed on. They're really, really smart. And this was quite a while. This was like 15 years ago this started. And it's still going on. It's called Dublin Core, by the way, because the library, there's a main, main library system in Dublin, Ohio, just outside of Columbus. And that's where they first met, and that's kind of where this stuff exists. Uh, DCMI, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, is still like a really, really big thing, especially in the library world. So 
there's another really cool implementation of this idea of trying to figure out how to talk about semantics of an application. It's called XMDP or XHTML metadata this metadata profiles. And it's by Tantic Chalik. Tantic Chalik is a very, very creative guy who also comes up with a thing called microformats, which is this, again, this notion of trying to describe things like semantic things. This is a person, this is an email address, this is how I do dates, sort of describing things that are independent. Both of these efforts were all based on HTML, which is kind of a bummer, I think, but it made sense at the time. And it's still very, very valuable. Microformats is still going very, very strong. X XMDP kind of fell off to the side. It depended on a feature inside HTML where I could actually have a thing called a profile, uh, and the HTML5 guys killed that. So it's a little bit harder to do, but it will come back in another life. But these are all ideas about focusing on the semantics, not on the other details. So then we get, we get this sort of lull in the storm, and then boom, a whole bunch of stuff starts happening. So uh, is it James Snell, who's, yeah, James Snell with Activity Streams comes up with this idea that uh, he, James had spent a lot of time in RDF and he understood about vocabulary and ontology. So he starts coming up with this idea of explaining how ac activities can be described. The same year, we also get finally this schema.org idea, which is this cooperative, like you guys are involved in this, right, in Microsoft, and everybody's kind of getting this notion, right, getting this notion of how can we describe things, how can we create their ontologies, how can we start to talk about things using the same terms. This is really, really, really smart. And of course, now activity streams and schema.org are blending together, which I think is really, really cool. Um, so around the same time, I started an experiment at, a, at an event called REST Fest, which was like four years ago. And it was, it was at the time, it was, I called I dubbed it Alice, Application Level Profile Semantics. How can we focus on just the profiles? And I, I took it directly from Tantic Chalik's work, and I did the same thing. I applied it only to HTML. What I did is I created an experiment. This is a group of about 40 or 50 people that show up. They're all kind of uber geeks, and they love this API stuff. And I published a spec, which was the, the vocabulary, the ontology, and I attached a, a meaning to these things. Like, this is the username, and this, is, this, this marks the URL that you post to, and this marks the URL that creates something. And I just wrote this all out in prose. And I said, write a client. And I didn't give him a server. I said, I will show up with the server. And let's see if the clients works. Let's see if just by just describing this application level semantics and it married it to some, uh, some details, the protocol would be supplied at runtime, the methods and stuff. And it actually worked amazingly well. There were some problems with it, but it worked amazingly well. And it got Leonard and I very excited about this idea. So it turns out, um, not too long after that, the IETF actually mints a link relation value called profile. It sort of recovers the profile value we lost in HTML5. So it creates it as a link relation value. And then that sort of leads to Leonard and I and another guy by the name of Mark Foster creating this ALPS pattern that is divorced of any particular media type. So now this is another way to think about describing things. We take a slightly different term we'll talk about in a little bit when we do at schema.org. It's a slightly different version. But what makes me excited, especially in these last couple of years, whenever I see this much going on, that gives me a hint that I think this is, in a, this is a problem and people are trying to think of how to solve it. So I think it's very cool. So really this is about shared understanding. We worked out the detail of shared understanding over protocol but we didn't work out the shared understanding over application domains. Now, one way to solve this problem is to create a special media type. So I can have an accounting media type that has all the things in it, or I can have a microblogging media type that has all the things in it. It's explained. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the group that does call control, you know, press four for me to ignore you for a while longer, that system, those guys created their own hypermedia type. It's called voice XML. And there's, a, there's another one that's sort of server-focused called call control XML. It's totally a hypermedia type. It has forms and has links and has embeds and navigations and mutability and post and all this other stuff in it. And it made it possible for people who are building hardware like desktop phone systems <laughs> and people who are building racks and people who are building call center hardware and people who are writing software to, to route calls to all do their work without ever knowing each other because they all use the same hypermedia type. It's incredible, and it also meant that they didn't have to come up with some generic API, static API that everybody had to use. People could be as creative as they want because they were creating a playground at affordances. 
That stuff still goes down today. Uh, SIP's pretty much overridden most of it, but uh, from 1998, that was a pretty cool hypermedia type. And there's still a lot. I, I run into it. I was just at a client last month that uses voice XM all the time for their work. So in a shared understanding pattern, when you're really focusing on that, what you really do is you want to focus on the domain vocabulary, and you want to do it independent of the protocol. Because I might do this over HTTP or XMPP or MQTT or CoAP or SMTP, but I still want to use the same vocabulary. So the vocabulary is independent of the protocol. It's also independent of the format. So I should be able to use the vocabulary whether I'm doing HTML or collection JSON or Siren or HAL or Atom or anything. I should be able to use the same vocabulary. Back to what Dublin Core was doing 15 years ago. That gives you a different set of options. Now we can agree on a protocol. We can negotiate a protocol. We can negotiate a format. And we can negotiate a vocabulary. So what we can do is we can actually say, these are the vocabularies I know. Could you please explain this to me in a vocabulary I know? I know these many languages. Please help me out. I got French, I got German, Spanish. One of these got to hit. Right? Can we talk? Does anybody know the Licklider problem? 1960s. Um, back when we thought we were going to find aliens sometime real soon, right? So a, a computer scientist, uh, and I don't remember his first name, J.C.R. Licklider, I think. He's got three things in his first name. Anyway, you could look it up. He came up with a thing called the Licklider problem. He says, when, I, when a machine meets another machine, like an outer, from outer space, how are they going to talk to each other? What's really going to happen? And he said, what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to probe, they're going to experiment, they're going to have to keep kind of poking at each other until they suddenly discover a commonality. And that's called the Licklider problem. He wrote a memo about it. It's like it was about the intergalactic network we're going to build someday from 1960s. And that's exactly what HTTP does. I can negotiate a format. Now with HTTP, I can actually negotiate an upgrade to another version of HTTP, and I can negotiate to WebSockets. I can negotiate. I can probe. And what we need to start doing is creating a way to negotiate for the domain, not just the format or the protocol. So when I see an HTML message, here's the domain things I see. For humans, it says, oh, this is where I go for home, and this is where I go for search, and this, this, might, this image might have something. Like that. That's the domain uh, for me, right? This is how I search. OK, so how do I do that for machines? I use RELs or names or classes in HTML, right? That's the domain information, right? And I can write a client that says, hey, look for the thing that says search, and then i got to supply a keyword, or look for the thing that goes home. I can write a bot that does this. I can write a bot that solves this problem because I'm sharing the understanding. That means I have to know it ahead of time. There's no magic here, right? M machines don't magically sort of, like, discover. What they do is they recognize. So um, what Leonard and I worked on is this idea of describing that vocabulary, those elements and those transitions, in a way that's independent from everything else. We, we did it in uh, an angle bracket version and a curly brace version for, for those who care. But basically, we said, look, what we need to do is describe um, how you can say something's a home uh, uh, transition. We said safe. How you can say something's a, a logo, and how you can say something is a search, and what the arguments would be. This is it. It doesn't say what format. It doesn't notice it doesn't have any URLs in it. All that other stuff can get decided at runtime. So it's a way to describe things a little bit more machine readable than just the Dublin Core list or the link relations list. Right? And what we're doing is really what schema.org is trying to do now, and that's include both the data elements and the actions. Right? So I think a lot of this is going to come together. By the way, Leonard and I don't really care which one it is. We just want it to happen. If it turns out that ALPS is a bad idea, fine. Let's do something else. Let's get it so that we can do these things in this independent way. So these are based, really, ALPS is based on the notion of, of going one step deep, deeper than those factors. What are, what's interesting about network communications are four things. Is it safe? Is it idempotent? Is it mutable? And is it a transclusion? Done. Every single interaction can be boiled down to that. If it's idempotent, I can do it over and over and over again. If it's safe, I don't have to worry about ever changing anything. Get is idempotent and safe. Right? If it's unsafe, but it's idempotent in HTTP, that'd be put. Right? 
in uh, FTP that would be S2R store. It was if it was unsafe and non-idempotent in FTP, it'd be store U, store unique. Like every one of these protocols will have something like this. Is it mutable? Can I actually change arguments, or is it fixed? Is it like a get form, or is it like an A tag, right? And is it a transclusion? Is it an I frame? Is it something I bring in, or is it something I take out? So once you can sort of boil all interactions into these sort of generic ways, you can describe these now without picking a protocol. And now I just need a little translator table. I just need a little bit of information. It's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So since I'm on XMPP, that means I'm going to use post here. Since I'm on HTML, I'll use get. Or HTTP, I'll use get, or so on and so forth. So those become the four things that are interesting. And it turns out, really, there, there's, some, there's some challenges to this, but I think it's a decent model. These two focus on what the server promises, and these two focus on what the clients can do. Server promises this is safe. That's all, that's all you can get is a promise. Server promises you can do this over and over again, and it's not going to change. Uh, the server says, you can change this if you like. And the server says, by the way, when you get this, you really ought to just include it in what you have. And the clients, both of these parties can kind of ignore this stuff in a big, bad world. It's easier if the, for these things to be ignored than these. You ignore these, and pretty much you got anarchy, and people are going to stop using your server. So, so this takes me to a Tim Berners-Lee thing when Tim was talking about linked open data. So a serious unbounded web. This is what we were really looking for. We've completely lost that in creating apps. We don't do that anymore. We just don't. We don't create a web. We create a standalone app that's dedicated to doing 17 things, and some of them have to be in a special order, and you better memorize it, and that's it. Build a special client for us. Thank you very much. Done. And there's certainly no low entry barrier anymore either. But I really think we can still do that. We can use linking. We can use this power law. We can use this idea of a minority of the nodes have a majority of the links. Again, that's how Google made its money, right? That's how you beat Yahoo at its game. And that's because it's a scale-free network. It's a network of nodes where certain nodes have more connections than others. We need to build apps like this. This is the real challenge. It's the thing that semantic, uh, that the, the semantic gap, if we can solve that, allows us to do but right now, this is incredibly hard for us. Building uh, basically a service that lets you mash it up into some application that this service never heard of, right? That's Donald Norman. Suddenly, you're creating things. You're creating affordances. You're creating objects where people are doing things that you never thought they would ever do. That service is on the web. So in one slide, it's all about separation. So format, protocol, Domain, like the problem, and even the workflow are all independent of each other. <coughs> you can change the format, and the domain's the same. You can change the protocol, and the domain's the same. You can change the workflow based on what you want to do with it. You don't have to do what the server says. You don't have to be a robot or an automaton. You can do what you want. And basically, Alps does that by being incredibly minimal. Here's the thing that describes a piece of data. Here's the thing that describes an action. Thank you. Go home. I'm going to give you a pile of these. I'm going to give you a playground. There's 17 uh, bits of data, and there's seven actions. You can build great apps with this. If I describe a general ledger, like a double entry bookkeeping system, I can build 17 different apps with that, with one vocabulary. Income statements, expense statements, invoicing systems, credit management, simple accounting, and bookkeeping, all that stuff is from the same vocabulary. Now I build a server that acts like that and lets you build whatever apps you want. And maybe even combine it with other things, right? So I didn't get a chance to work up a detailed demo on this. I'm going to let you look at the slides. This is actually an Alps version that's in, in uh, JSON. And it says you basically have uh, a, a little bit of data, a little action, and some data elements. You can look at these slides later. We can talk about them a little bit more. Basically, it lets you, the other big thing about Alps is it sort of describes what the interface looks like, given name, family name, email, and telephone. Now, my data says first name, last name, voice phone, right? So the rule is when I talk to the outside world, I have to use their vocabulary. I have to translate. 
So what I would do is I would produce a message. This happens to be in collection JSON that says I'm using this particular vocabulary. That's my profile, and I translate it into given name, family name, email, telephone. Like I'm going to talk your talk. Now it doesn't matter what I store. It doesn't even matter if I store it in 17 different places. When my interface is doing the, the contacts interface, I'll always I'll always talk this way, so you'll always understand it. You don't need to know how I'm storing it. Document database, hierarchical database, file system, who cares? Right? It's just the interface that we share. All right. So REST, HTTP, hypermedia, and semantics, right? Summarize this up. REST is a network architecture. This is the other thing that's really weird, right? It's not a coding style, right? It's a network style. It's a style of how I arrange machines. Properties plus requirements get you constraints. The other big thing that he said is data is an architectural element, which was like really freaky at the time. Uh, usually there were there was these two things called uh, components and connectors. Right? We use these in MVC, model view controller, and the component is the thing that does thing, a connector puts them all together. Components don't need to know about each other, they just know the connector. He also said that data was an architectural element. Why? Because the affordance shows up there. Uniform API for all was also kind of wacky. He wants to use hypermedia to change state and the information is the affordance. For the CRUD thing, we got this resource-oriented architecture pattern, URI plus object equals the resource. That's how we start on URIs. We focus on them, and we manipulate them with those methods. Lucky for us, there's only four. And we use objects. We ship objects around back and forth. And the URI is the affordance. Like, we look at the URI and says, oh, look, there's a relationship there. Oh, I recognize that English word. That's user. Right? That's our whole affordance. We even write some URIs that actually have the word get in them. People get really excited. It says get list. Oh, you're not supposed to do that. Those three characters have to go. Right? There's just characters in a row. And then we have this notion of hypermedia, which is actually based on the tasks, the things you want to do. How do I search? How do I add? How do I get rid of something? Data plus instructions equals the representation. I'm focused on the representation now. And the tasks I want to get done, not the objects. There are no objects in the real world. There are no objects. I perceive data, and I apply a model, and that's information. Oh, that's a chair. That orange thing is a chair. Like That's why magic works, right? Magic and illusion works because I trick you into applying a model that doesn't exist. I make you think it's in my hand, and it's not, right? Because we really just perceive things. We manipulate state via the hypermedia controls, and the message is the affordance. It's actually the message that has the instructions in it. And then we talk a little bit about the challenge of semantics. We want to model the domain. So we take data, the data and the transitions. That's actually the model. We focus on this idea of I should be able to link from the outside, not a closed world. And we keep this, keep it separate from protocols and formats and workflow. Some hard stuff there, but Sam's group is doing some very cool stuff in that area. Some other people are doing the same. And I think we're going to end up with some really, really, really cool stuff in the next couple years on that. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I work on a lot. And I'd love to talk to you guys about what you're doing here, answer any questions you have here or there. Hi, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say again, thank you for the time, for taking the time to, to invite me here. And, Listen, I'd love to talk more. All right. That's it. That's what I got. Perfect.